Hello and welcome back to the workshop. Now, if you've jumped straight across from Ian's video, first of all, hi. Uh, if you're just here for the shooting, probably head to about the last 10 minutes of this vid. I'll try and put a timestamp in there. Uh, but I heartily invite you to uh, stay for the rest of it. Maybe I've got some extra information for you if you're interested. Uh, so, for those of you who are not jumping across, this is a video about the French AA-52, a sort of Cold War general purpose machine gun. So before we delve into the mechanics of this uh, curious beast, uh, first of all, a little bit of history. So uh, prior to 1940, France, as with many armies, uh, had the principle of having all sorts of different automatic firearms for different roles within the different armed forces. Uh, this was nothing unusual. So the infantry would have a uh, dedicated light machine gun. That would be this one, FM 2429, which would have a long career well after 1940. Uh, then there would be uh, dedicated machine guns, Hotchkiss and so on. Then there would be vehicle mounted variants, uh, whether it was uh, light vehicles or tanks. Uh, then there would be aviation machine guns uh, of all different roles and of course naval machine guns as well. So uh, this is all well and good. Logistically it's not all well and good um, as France learned in the uh, fighting in 1940. So. A uh, project was launched on the 11th of October 1941. Very curious date, 1941 in France, but that's what the records say. Um, to develop uh, a general purpose machine gun, at least for the infantry. So that means it would serve the role both of uh, a heavier machine gun and a light machine gun. Obviously being interchangeable between uh, the two roles with the minimum amount of uh, transformation needed to swap between the roles. So um, the common features were uh, it should have a locked breech which would be recoil operated or gas operated. It should be air cooled, uh, sort of preference of French service since forever. Uh, it should be fed by a linked belt or detachable belt. Uh, then we have it should have a right hand side or bottom ejection, uh, right hand side cocking lever and no safety. Tradition carries on. Um, so, uh, when it comes then to separating the roles between LMG and MG, LMG should have a 50 centimeter barrel, relatively short, weigh uh, seven kilos maximum. Um, it should have a stock with a thingy that goes up, which it does, and um, bipod, it should have a bipod and monopod as it did on the FM2429. Uh, now for the MG, it can be obviously a bit heavier. It would have a, have a longer barrel, 75 centimeters. It could weigh up to 13 kilos, uh, obviously to compensate for having probably a longer and heavier barrel. And it should have a removable stock. It might not be appropriate in uh, certain positions. And it should be also kitted out with a two position mount so that it could be both used against terrestrial targets and also in the role of anti-aircraft. And um, the, by, the uh, mount should weigh no more than 13 kilos. Now, as you might suspect, uh, despite all the good intentions of the Armament Commission, um, the occupation effectively stalled all development in the, in the direction of such a firearm. Uh, so nothing happens until after liberation. And on the 25th of May, 1945, a new set of requirements comes out, um, drawing on a lot of feedback from uh, both German weaponry and of course the allied weaponry. Uh, you know, they had a good first-hand experience of the Brens, uh, they'd seen the MG42 and so on. So time to refresh the requirements and uh, see what they can make out of it. So um, they require it to be less than seven kilos, uh, including the bipod. Uh, then we have a quick change barrel. They really like that. Um, note that they were perfectly aware of it when they developed this one. Uh, they just didn't seem to consider it appropriate. But obviously uh, combat experience uh, dictated that that would be, after all, quite a nice feature to have. Um, they have, however, dropped all limitations on the operating system. So anybody is free to suggest whatever they want as long as it works. So uh, typical, again, of French procurement, just have some vague requirements, see what everyone presents, and then take the best of the lot. Um, they require now to have, uh, to be fed by 50 round belts or 30 round box magazines. So 
FM there, still uh, leaving a little, a little uh, fingerprint. And the rate of fire should be between 500 and 900 rounds per minute. And last of all, of course, the general requirement, it should be uh, easy and simple to manufacture. Um, also, the preference is explicitly expressed for um, minimizing machining operations. So there's you know, minimal use of lathe uh, operations, but to maximize the use of things like stamping, uh, sintering, casting, obviously wherever appropriate. And uh, you can clearly see that they really went to town on, uh, on this firearm uh, just on that requirement. Uh, disassembly, of course, should be simple without any tools and uh, be as easy and quick as a disassembly of this one. By the way, I have a full video on the FM2429 if you haven't already seen it. So from the date of the relaunch of the project until the adoption date of this machine gun, there's actually very little information out there as to um, what development steps were taken, what prototypes were presented, what locking mechanisms they contemplated and so on. And I suspect that most of it is still classified um, just because France, basically. Um, so, nevertheless, on the 22nd of August uh, 1952, this is adopted as the Arme Automatique Modèle 1952, um, Automatic Firearm, Model 1952. Sometimes there's a little T in the designation Arnaud Automatique Transformable. So that's a little indication of its modular nature for different roles. Now, uh, in terms of the other players uh, involved, I can tell you for certain that uh, Saint-Étienne Arsenal was involved. Châtelot was involved because this is theirs. Um, there was also the Armament Studies uh, Institute in Mulhouse and also uh, Merlin Guérin, which is more known for the, um, what's it called, the MGD SMG, so a little folding submachine gun with a weird clock spring in there. They, they tried to implement that system into absolutely everything, uh, but uh, succeeded nowhere. Anyway, um, the model produced by Mac was the winner. Um, largely, it comes down to its extensive use of uh, stamped steel and drawn steel, uh, as you will see in a minute. So aside from its ridiculously simple construction, um, perhaps the most surprising feature is that it uses a lever delay blowback system and an asymmetric one at that. Um, now it's more associated nowadays with the FAMAS, of course, which uses the same principle. Um, but in fact, uh, Châtelot had already been experimenting with it for quite some time, at least since 1947, because we know that the prototypes they submitted for the SMG trials, which ultimately uh, ended with the uh, MAT-49 being adopted, uh, also used the same system. So uh, it was something they had, you know, they'd been working on for quite a while and they knew what they were doing. Uh, if you want to know more about the physics uh, about of, of the system implemented in the A52 and in the FAMAS, then I have an entire video on that, very, very nerdy, and I'll put that at the end of this vid if you're interested. Um, and from a French procurement point of view, this is equally surprising because the, the delay blowback system that they use had actually already been patented before the, uh, the firearm was developed. Um, usually uh, the French military like to steal everyone's ideas and give them nothing back. Um, that's not to say that the inventor got anything from the French state uh, when they did decide to use the system, but that's perhaps another story. So, um, Let's have a closer look at this thing. Now, since this is uh, such a long gun, I thought we would start at the muzzle end and then progressively work our way back, identifying the various interesting features. So, let's start at the muzzle. So we'll start with uh, the flash hider here at the muzzle. Now, this is the very first pattern. It is essentially just a tube. Um, the later ones have a more traditional birdcage pattern as uh, in Ian's one. And the bipod behind it is uh, straight off the FM2429. Uh, somewhat crude, but it does the job. It uh, gives you some tilt in uh, two axes. So suitable, uh, just a bit crude and also not quick detachable. Um, relatively easy, you just have to remove a pin, uh, but not something you'd do in the field. In the rear sight, it's collapsible. And uh, the actual rear sight itself you can adjust 
loosen this screw and then you can shunt it left and right. The actual shape is very reminiscent of what is on the Bertie rifle, so a big post for course aiming and then if you want to attempt something a little finer there is a little notch there on the top. Now there's a recess here which uh, would have housed something uh, luminous and most probably radioactive so uh, luckily that's long gone. Now as to the barrel itself, um, relatively coarsely finished, you can see the tooling marks still on there, Got sling swivel, that's just pressed on. We have some markings on the top here, FM25, so it's a uh, LMG barrel, 7.5, that's to indicate the calibre, uh, because there is of course a uh, 308 version for the ANF1 configuration later. Um, but of course there are features that prevent you from mounting the wrong barrel onto the right receiver. Then we have the carry handle, rough cast part, didn't really bother finishing it off, and a nice little touch here with the wooden handle. So the rest, I need two hands, so we're back in a second. Now to remove the barrel, all I need to do is push back this catch. This is the uh, first model of a barrel catch. Later there is one which is a simple push down one. And I can tell you that was a really good idea because even though there's some nice finger grooves here on the top, um, this is actually very sharp here on the top. And actually the, the uh, manual at the time says that uh, you should use a cartridge to do so. Now this is a very dirty girl, sorry. Um, so yes, put a cartridge tip in the, a little slot provided there on the catch. Push that back sufficiently. It's quite a stout spring, as it should be. And then rotate the barrel and pull it out. So um, this kind of profile will be uh, familiar to anybody who likes uh, their uh, Czech uh, machine guns. So we have a three-lobed interrupted thread, which then, of course, locks into corresponding threaded sections in this sleeve in the front of the receiver. Now the barrel uh, in this particular place is surprisingly ancient. Uh, it's from uh, 1958. So this uh, comes from a period when the A852 was actually not even in general use. So uh, sort of pre-production barrel almost. Barrel, the rifling is still pretty good. And the chamber, uh, I'll include a shot, is uh, fluted as is very common in these delayed blowback systems. So what we have left here is quite reminiscent of uh, some kind of Star Wars blaster. Now on the front here we have the mounting sleeve for uh, the barrel. Now this intriguing recess here is actually part of the uh, arrangement for the um, machine gun mount. So we have one part that inserts in there and another part on the other side of the barrel. So I was very intrigued by this hole at the beginning. Then we have a uh, dust cover, which is also a case deflector. So this is normally shut when the, the uh, bolt is forward. And as soon as you open the action, it springs open. On the side here, we see the side of the feed tray. And we have a little hook here on the side. And that is for this hanging this bag, which would hold a 50 round belt. Usually in the light machine gun roll, not so important when it's in fixed on a mount. So here is some link, which we'll put to good use later. Yeah. Then we have uh, the front, the rear sight, sorry, um, sort of mounted backwards compared to the more traditional way. But at least it's not on the side this time. On the other side, we have the cocking handle and we have this bulge here which is uh, holding the hardened insert, so the, uh, the camming surface for the operating system. So uh, I can't really show you that in any clear way, but it's in there and it's replaceable. Now, if you open the top cover, we can see the feed mechanism, which is reminiscent, but not identical to the MG42 system. Uh, they've done away with the complicated um, scissor mechanism in which there's a, a two, um, two portion shunt of one cartridge towards the deflector which points the cartridge down towards the chamber. Uh, we have just two poles here that prevent the belt from being pulled out backwards and we have a single 
shunting arm here, which is controlled by the bolt, which simply grabs the next cartridge, shoves it towards the deflector, and goes backwards and forwards like that. So this is, of course, also elastic, so it can ride over on its way to the left, catch the cartridge, and shove it towards the deflector. So this is all pressed steel and riveted components. So I'm guessing that if something did go wrong, they just chuck the whole unit out. Now we can remove it simply by removing the cross pin on the top. And the system is sprung to maintain in an open position. So it's fighting against the pin. So, well, one moment. There we go. So that's the feed tray. Now on the uh, 308 version, they have welded an extra little plate on here so that you can't put in a uh, 7.5 belt in a 308 feed tray. And here is the feed unit. You can see all riveted bits on top. There are the sprung poles here and the deflector. So for those who are perhaps disinclined to uh, look at half an hour of uh, physics, I'll just give a quick run through of how the system works. So here you can see the uh, steel insert, the hardened steel insert against which the lever is going to work. And as I said, you can replace it. All you need to do is punch out this pin, stick a new one in and secure it in place. Now this works from an open bolt, of course. So here it's locked back and ready to go. Here is a, a lever. You have a spare one in the spares kit. So at this moment, it is lying parallel to the receiver wall. So it's pushed back against the bolt body and the bolt head essentially acts as the pivot point. So this short lever is going to contact the shoulder inside here and the long lever is pushing against the bolt body. So when we pull the trigger, the two parts move forward. Notice there is a separation between the bolt body and bolt head. Here we can see the firing pin. So the cartridge gets picked up like so. The bolt head stops and the bolt body catches up with it. As it does so, the lever here is rotated get right around, is rotated into and uh, up against the camming shoulder and the firing pin goes forward and fires the shot. Now what happens then under recoil, I'll try and do this, it's a kind of three-handed job. Where is my monopod? There we go. Because the springs are understandably pretty stiff. Okay. So under recoil, we get, of course, a force acting against the bolt head. This is going to cause it to move backwards, which is going to cause the, the uh, locking shoulder here to rotate ever so slightly. But of course, we've got a longer lever arm here on this side. So it's pushing back the bolt body, which, by the way, is 14 ounces heavier than the bolt head, 400 grams. So this starts to move back move back at a faster rate than the bolt head and this causes the delay and by the time the system has unlocked so that means the lever is parallel once again to the side of the receiver pressure is reduced enough that it's safe to open and then the case gets dumped out the bottom well you get the idea all right, next up is the uh, grip and trigger group. Now this looks suspiciously like one of an MG42. And in fact, the very first models of the A52 just used uh, MG42 grips and trigger groups. Um, there are some cosmetic changes down the line. Um, it would be interesting to see whether the changes are purely cosmetic and that the parts are still indeed interchangeable. So uh, next time 
this and MG42 are in the same space, we shall have to check that. Um, since this is full auto or nothing, very simple trigger group and with a cross bolt safety. So they did incorporate a safety after all. So let's have a look at the rear of the receiver. Still plenty of interesting things going on. So we have this heavy stirrup shaped reinforcement, which is uh, welded in place. We've got the rear uh, sling attachment here. And then we have this uh, rear block, which does all sorts of things and the stock. Now the stock here in its forward position actually also prevents the bolt from uh, working. Well, it doesn't block it completely, but you really have to pull it back. So uh, it's a kind of a security in case you accidentally hook onto the cocking lever, I suppose. So yeah, you can't use it with the uh, stock here pushed in. You need to pull it out fully. There's only one position and it locks into place with these two locking lugs on the, the rear block here. And you can release it with this little lever underneath. So you can remove it altogether. That was one of the requirements. If you're using it uh, on, the, on the tripod, you obviously don't need the stock in place. So here's a view of the uh, rear block and we can really remove it by removing this pin, which is screwed in place. This is uh, also harking back to its predecessor. And it wants to spring up because there is a top surface here which hooks into the reinforced part there. And we have the recoil spring that wants to escape with its guide rod. So there it has the block here as a seat for the end of the guide rod. So um, this also has a hole in the bottom, which is for the monopod. That clicks into place like that. And you can release it with this little button. So this, uh, I've got the machining drawing for this. It's an incredibly complex part. Um, yeah, through one of the, probably the second most complex part to machine in the entire gun. Um, monopod here, uh, again, harks back to the predecessor, except this is somewhat more industrial. Uh, lots of stampings, but it works the same way. You can extend and retract and lock it in place by this wing nut. So yes, this is a critical component because um, with this locking surface on the top, which is nested inside the reinforcement section and this cross pin, effectively that is the only thing that is preventing the bolt from going back into your face. So uh, it's slightly disconcerting that even when it's fully screwed in, that's still a fair amount of rattle but uh, this is apparently completely normal, so the uh, veterans tell me. In fact, this one apparently is rather tight. So with most components off, we can have a look at the receiver itself. Um, fairly simple. In fact, it's two halves uh, of stamped steel, which is then rather coarsely welded together. Uh, the welds are tidied up where necessary. You can see here, underneath as well. So really they kept the machining really, really down to a minimum. Okay, and finally, let's get the bolt out. So I'll just put the cocking lever back. Cocking lever is non-reciprocating. You can remove it quite easily. It's got a little spring detent here to make sure that it stays in its forward position once you've cocked the action. And now let's pull out the bolt, which is incredibly long, like most uh, delayed blowback systems. And there we go. So it's in two sections. So the firing pin here at the top. Now it seems incredibly exposed, but that does of course mean that it's incredibly easy to replace. You can just pull it out, put a new one in. Instantly, the 7.5 French uh, firing pin has a pointy tip and the 308 ones have a rounded tip. So then you just put a new one in and you're good to go. Here is the uh, famous locking lever. So I'll pull the two parts separately. So you can see the difference in size and therefore in mass between the two. Um, this surface here is what the uh, long lever pushes against. You can see it in there. 
So as I said, that's the, the bolt head just acts as a pivot point for the lever here. So you can take that out as well. And on the front of the bolt face, we simply have the extractor. Now, ejection is actually made by the underside of the um, feed tray. And just going quickly back to the uh, main body, we have this surface up here, which is the guide surface for the uh, feed mechanism, for the feed claw. So this is what's causing the arm to go left and right to feed the belt through. And on the back here, we have a buffer. So there's an insanely strong spring in there. Um, you just have to believe me, I, I really can't push it in myself, but it is in there. That's what the drawings say. Um, so that also slams against the the rear block here. So I reassembled everything and uh, I'll just go through the loading procedure since I'm going to be on a very busy range and you probably won't be able to hear a word I'm saying. So uh, as I noted at the beginning this can be fed either from a detachable belt, so this is a AA52 link here, this way, uh, or you can use uh, conventional belts uh, the ones for the MG42 and MG34 work just fine, which is what these are. And uh, loading procedure, if you happen to have uh, the pull tab, is bolt forward, just feed it in until you hear a click, like so. Then pull the bolt back, and then you're good to go. So in this position, the cartridge is there underneath the deflector, ready to be fed into the chamber. Now, if you don't have a pull tab, what you do is cock the action, open the cover, have two links which are uh, empty, and you hook the furthermost link just over the edge of the uh, feed tray and close the action and you're good to go. Before we head to the range uh, I thought I'd just show you uh, the standard spare parts kit that would come with the gun. Now here we have uh, a tool for changing the extractor, we have a spare inertia lever, we have a trigger group pin, cross pin, have pin punch, rear block pin, one of the things you may be likely to lose in the tall grass. And then we have lots of firing pins. Now normally this would actually come with just two spares, but uh, I've got four, more the merrier. Then we have extractors, two, we have an extractor plunger and extractor springs. So there we go. Uh, I think I'll have a shower first and um, then head to the range. Ja, ja. 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 
Shoulder flip, clap if you want on the top. Nice. There you go. <laughs> Interesting. I'm not sure I like it. So here's what the bolt looks like after about 200 rounds. Honestly, I thought it would be worse. Um, the blowback and the uh, fluted chamber. But um, yeah, the muck doesn't seem to be going too far back. Interestingly, you can see the deposits on the feed tray. There's a nice bit of a brass plating and some copper plating there from the, the bullet tips. Now I'm sure some of you will have been uh, screaming that I've been kept on putting the cocking lever, leaving the cocking lever back. Uh, yes, that is uh, I mea culpa, sorry, in my haste to get shooting, I forgot to push it forward after cocking. But for my sins, I of course have pulled cleaning duty. So uh, in terms of actually shooting it, I can tell you it's extremely comfortable to shoot. Uh, the rate of fire is uh, so much faster than the uh, FM2429, but not excessively so. Um, you can still do long bursts and not sort of lose your field of vision like with an MG42, uh, and you also don't get the spinal realignment. Um, short bursts, extremely comfortable and very easy to do. The trigger is, uh, is fine, um, it's not excessively heavy. The recoil is straight back into your shoulder. Uh, so uh, obviously with the bipod and monopod configuration, um, it's obviously very, very comfortable, you can shoot that all day. But even just with it hanging flipped onto your shoulder, it's also quite enjoyable. Apparently for the bloke, not so much. Uh, but I think he's allergic to French calibers. Um, and from the hip, uh, I did that because it's fun and it's also actually in the manual that you could, you can theoretically use it for walking fire. That was not dead in the 50s. Um, you can see that it has a tendency to pull down low right, but I think you can pretty easily get used to compensating for that. Um, I was already doing it, if you compare, <coughs> compare the first burst and the last burst, I was already moving far less down and I could start to control it a bit. A bit. So I'm sure with proper training, you could probably, if it was a right thing to do at the time, um, use it effectively from the hip. Uh, no pictures of anyone using it from the shoulder, but I don't think that would be very pleasant, especially with the belt. Um, so, um, I just thought I'd maybe close up with a quick discussion of uh, the usage of the machine gun. Obviously, at the beginning, as I said, the, uh, the idea was to produce something primarily multi-role for the infantry, uh, but it, of course, then exploded into a host of other roles, and in fact, it's probably still somewhere uh, mounted on a vehicle. Now officially it's been replaced by the FN mag since about nine, uh, 19, 2010 But you know, these things take a long time um, Now from 1963 there is the ANF1 version of this that comes out which is chambered in 308 um, That does need a couple of modifications But I will let Ian McCullum cover that because I know he has a video coming out on just that variant So uh, I'll leave the surprise to him um, yes, but in terms of the role, obviously the uh, light machine gun, 
machine gun, tripods. Uh, then we have um, mounted on tanks, jeeps, um, alouette, uh, light helicopters. Uh, they're also in the nose of the Fuga Magister, which is more of a trainer type aircraft. And I've also seen pictures of it you being used as a deck gun on the naval craft. So uh, this has had a very long and uh, very diverse life. So um, I think we're at the end of the vid now. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed uh, both the technical and the shooting side. Uh, thank you, of course, for all your support across all the platforms. And I hope to see you again next time. Bye.